The first test between South Africa and Ireland is in the books. Welcome back to the channel. That's what we're going to be talking about. So if you're looking to avoid the result of the first test at Loftus Versfield, now is the time to click off the video, come back when you have caught up. For the rest of you, let me know what you made of it. What are your headlines? What are your takeaways from that game and from South Africa's victory by a score? It's one of the most highly anticipated summer tours I think there has ever been, really. The number one and number two ranked teams in the world, the world champions against the best team in the Six Nations. Loads of talk off the field. Did it deliver? It was a really good test match and there's so much to unpick. For me, it didn't quite live up to the billing, I didn't think. The main reason for that is, in my opinion, Ireland weren't quite at their best, which I think is what Andy Farrell has said afterwards, speaking to the press. A lot of that is to do, obviously, with the good work that South Africa did and were able to do, and I'll come on to that. But for me, it looked like an Ireland team that just weren't quite there in a few different areas of the game. And we saw that in the opening few minutes, that South African try, which again, to give the box credit, they took really, really well. They exploited the space. The hands was good. And Aaron's in terms of the finish is obviously exceptional. But I thought it gives a little insight. It's quite a good reflection of just maybe Ireland being a fraction off it. And when you are playing a team as good as the box, the world champions in their own backyard at altitude, you're very rarely going to be able to get away with it. And actually, you give Ireland credit for the fact that it was a one-score game because I don't think there are many other teams, there's probably no other team in the world that could be faced with that sort of challenge and that sort of environment, not be at their best, be a bit off it, and it still be a one-score game. So there is credit where it is due from an Ireland point of view. Those are my kind of general thoughts on the match. I'm interested to know if you agree with me or whether you think it was a more scintillating test match. But yeah, I thought it was good. Two really high quality sides, some serious physicality as you would expect and some really nice stuff. Just maybe not the, maybe not the blockbuster test match that I was hoping for. But let's start with the box because I think it's easy to forget. I know their players have been playing in the URC all season, but they've had that one game against Wales. They've got quite a few players or a certain amount of players that have been playing in Japan so haven't played for a little while. I think there's still a sense that they're probably shifting through the gears as well. But there was a couple of really notable things. One of them is probably what I mentioned already in terms of that opening try and looking to go wide. I think the, the way in which the Springboks have attacked over the last kind of like three or four years, there's been that development from it all the way back from when Erasmus first came in and they won the World Cup in 2019 and they were very, very effective. But there was a certain kind of, maybe one dimensional is a bit harsh, but a, a certain way in which they looked to attack. They were very, very direct. Whilst they are still direct, they have slowly over that time, I think, looked to spread the ball wider. And we saw that a number of times today. There was a number of times off first phase where they were looking to get in the outside channels. That was something that I think was very, very noticeable for me and something to keep an eye on for the rest of this series, for the test next weekend, and also throughout the rest of the year for the box in terms of what their attacking shape looks like. The other part of the Springboks game, which you always expect, but is still so impressive, is the defensive side of it. Because whilst Ireland were off it, and as I've said already, I think they were, I don't think their attack was quite as slick. I don't think any areas really of the Ireland game were, were quite as good as we've seen them be previously. That South African defence was still able to repel them and keep them out and make life incredibly difficult for them on a whole host of different occasions. Even when the game was quite tight and Ireland would have the ball in the spring box 22, they were able to stand that barrage and get themselves out of trouble. It is the, the backbone of that team that has seen them become the back-to-back -back world champions. So a lot for South Africa, I think, to build upon here and to look ahead and move on to for the rest of their season for this final series and then the rugby championship as well because that's going to be key for the box I would imagine Springbok fans let me know in the comments but you know despite all the success of this team the fact they've won two world cups it's still generally been the all blacks that have dominated the rugby championship so that surely off the back of the world cup is going to be something they've got their sights set on but let's chat about Ireland as I say, I think they did just look off it. And South Africa are a big part of that. Let me re-emphasise that. I'm not looking to detract from what the box did well. But what was the reason for Ireland's performance? And it's maybe just a couple of percent here and there. At this level, in these sorts of test matches, it, it isn't a big difference, but it's enough. 
And I've seen some people kind of suggesting it's the end of a long season. There's fatigue, playing at altitude. They were just kind of fatigued at the end of the season. I struggle to buy into that narrative because, first of all, the Bok players have also been at the end of a long domestic season. And secondly, one of the things we always credit Ireland with the most is their system and the way in which their players are controlled, I suppose. Their game time is controlled, the way in which they're able to rotate. I mean, we saw Leinster do it again this year towards the end of the URC and it meant they ended up not getting a home semi-final. So maybe it was a mistake. But I struggled to buy into the kind of the players are tired at the end of a long season. I just wonder more whether it is... First of all, the playing at altitude and being put under a lot of pressure by South Africa. And then maybe it's missing some of those key players. You know, when you're missing Jameson Gibson Park at nine, he is the metronome of your team. Maybe some of those things had more of an impact. But the kind of idea that the players are just tired at the end of the season, I struggle to buy into. And there was always a sense, I felt, even though, even though the game was close and even though Ireland showed some real spirit, really, when you go behind that early in the match to keep yourselves in it, to put yourself in positions where you could even take the lead or get something out of the game feasibly when it's just a one-score game at the end of it. It's a, I think it's actually a really, really good reflection of this Ireland team. I don't think they were great, but they've still only lost by a score at loftus Versfeld away to South Africa on their homecoming off the back of the World Cup. Like that is, that is this Andy Farrell Ireland team. So credit where it's due in terms of the way they fought but they were off it and I always felt like they were holding on. It, it, even though the game was close, to me, I, I just had that sense that South Africa would be the team that would have enough. I suppose there's one final element that it's worth having a chat about and that is the TMO intervention. I've seen some people suggesting that the ref and the TMO were kind of more on the South African side of things. It's the two decisions, isn't it? So it's the James Lowe try that got chalked off because Ronan Kelleher was penalised for hooking it back in the ruck when he was already off his feet. And then there's the Cheslin Colby try where James Lowe had thrown it back in and was he out and all that sort of thing. The first one, the Kelleher one, I think if you're looking at it, it's probably the correct decision. I didn't have a huge amount of complaints with it. I think there could be a wider discussion about whether the TMO needs to come in there, possibly. We often see it with Ben Whitehouse, don't we? He does, as a TMO, I think, like to nitpick. Is that the sort of thing that he needs to be coming in for? Well, maybe, because it's led to a try, a lot of the Springbok fans might say. But I think that is a, it's a valid route of inquiry and discussion, even if we end up saying, do you know what, he was right to come in there and the try should have been chalked off. I think it was probably the correct decision. The second one, again, I don't have a huge problem with, but, I could, but just because I don't think there is conclusive evidence to say that Lowe was definitely in touch. Like, he might have been, it's really, really tight, but if, they don't, if they're not absolutely certain, I don't have a huge problem with them then awarding the try. But they are two big decisions and two big decisions that have gone against Ireland. So I understand why they are a talking point. But for me, I think on this occasion, they're probably the correct ones. But I can tee myself up for the Ireland fans in the comments disagreeing with me and telling me that I'm wrong. The one final thing from an Ireland point of view that I will mention actually is James Lowe. He is brilliant which is nothing new. He's been like this for a while. But you look at the try he set up in the first half, just his influence as a winger and being able to influence big moments in the game is just so consistent. He does it so consistently. I thought he was excellent, despite the fact that actually off the restart when... Uh, was it just after Ireland had scored? I think it was. I think it was just after they'd scored the try towards the end of the game kind of messing up the restart and trying to catch it at the back and it ends up taking it back over his line. It's a five metre scrum, which South Africa get a penalty try from. That I think is where it was the playing at altitude and the brain just being a little bit slower and the thought process a little bit foggier. Probably saw it from both sides. I mean, Quagga Smith was dropping restarts and dropping balls at one point as well. So it impacts everyone. But overall, I think James Lowe is an exceptional, exceptional rugby player. So there it is, one more test to go. And the big question is, can Ireland bounce back? Because even though they now can't win the series, for me, drawing a series in South Africa against this team, when you're one down, would still be a huge achievement for this side. And the way in which they kept it close in the first test suggests to me that they'll have the character to give it a really good go in the second. But they are, make no mistake about it, up against it. As for the box, 
1-0 up. They'll look to close out the series next weekend. And as I say, look ahead. Well, they won't be looking ahead now, but start to give themselves the perfect platform, I suppose, is the better way of saying it, ahead of the rugby championship. It's going to be interesting. Let me know what you made of it. Comment down below. Like the video. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel as well. I'll see you in the next one.